So it's late spring and it's definitely a transition between one season and another. A lot of the spring crops are bolting, like this rhubarb plant right here. So this has sent up a flower and I'm not quite ready for the rhubarb to be done. So I'm just going to take this right off of the base of the pair of scissors and I'll talk more about this in a sec. Uh, the spinach in the greenhouse has also bolted, so I'm removing that and I talk about that on the show. And then things are really starting to grow fast. So that includes seeds that I've planted, transplants that I'm bringing outside and hardening off. And I describe hardening off and best practices for doing that to make sure your transplants really thrive in your garden. But another thing that's taking off is definitely the weeds. So as fast as our gardens are growing, weeds often can feel like they're growing even faster. So annual weeds, non-invasive perennials, and then invasive perennials are all things that I'm dealing with in the garden. I'm going to talk today about strategies for weeding, but also strategies for not letting weeds uh, take over your mental space and discourage you from gardening. Because I have to say, some days I'm feeling pretty tired, but there's a lot of summer ahead and it's a really exciting time of year because all of the spring work is sort of starting to uh, come into fruition and I can't wait to share it with you. So stay tuned for today's show. So this is the Culinary Garden Show. I'm Sarah Evans. I'm a master gardener and a restaurant owner in Sackville, New Brunswick. And I'm excited to share weekly what's happening in our garden and talk to some other garden folks around the Maritimes as well. So I'm here in the rhubarb patch and there is a rhubarb flower forming. So it's kind of a beautiful looking flower in some ways. Uh, rhubarb is related to buckwheat, so it looks similar to that. So we don't want the rhubarb to flower because when it flowers and sets seed, it's taking away energy from the leaves and the stalks. And the stalks of the leaves is what we do want to harvest. So if you let your rhubarb flower, and the, these flowers will get quite tall, about twice as tall as this one, which is about a foot and a half off the ground, um, then it will usually just stop producing leaves, stop producing stems, and it's kind of finished. So to keep your rhubarb producing longer, you want to pull off these stems as soon as you see them with the flower stalks on them. Um, sometimes you can catch them when they're just buds that are just emerging out of the, the crown of the rhubarb, and sometimes you wait until they get big enough. But either way, you can just cut them off and they will stop producing these eventually and just keep uh, producing stems and leaves, which is what you want. A lot of people are saying this year that their rhubarb is bolting early and it's hard to say why that's happening but some theories are that it was a pretty mild winter in the Canadian Maritimes also that it's been a warm spring we've had a couple uh, quick warm times but also rhubarb will bolt more if it's in a crowded environment and if it needs nutrients. So if you find your rhubarbs bolting really quickly, a great thing to do is to uh, dig it up and thin it out when you're done harvesting. And that'll give the rhubarb a little bit more space and then it will uh, not be as quick to bolt in the spring. And we do not want the rhubarb to flower because we want to continue to harvest the rhubarb uh, we do a lot with it in the kitchen, make syrups, make desserts, make different sauces. So uh, we want to prolong the harvest as long as we can. And it's only mid-May, right? It's a big day in the spring garden and it's cleaning out the winter greenhouse. Uh, we've had spinach in here all spring that I planted last October and then some I seeded as well a little bit later on. But it's pretty much done. It's bolting. So what bolting is, is when the plant uh, is convinced that the temperatures are too high or it's been alive too long or it's gone through a cold period and so it's finished growing and it's going to flower and then it's going to set seed. So this is great if you want to save some spinach seed but really uh, what I want is it to produce leaves. Uh, so yeah I'm going to cut down all the spinach that's bolting. I'm going to harvest it and use it because it's not too far gone yet. I find spinach isn't too bad if it's starting to bolt. Uh, after that it can get like a little bit of a almost like a sour flavor instead of the sweet flavor of the earlier spring spinach but uh, I'm going to use actually the spinach almost as like a spinach rob like a broccoli rob so like the shoots uh, as something for our green fritters so it's still useful vegetable matter that we can eat that's quite delicious and then I'm going to use the leaves and salads so we've got those to pull up I've got some rows of spinach 
as well as the rows of radishes. So we seeded the radishes really early on and they're doing super well. And we've been eating lots of radishes in the restaurant, which is awesome. And then I've got some mustard greens and some cilantro and some parsley as well. So everything's going a little bit wild right now. And I'm gonna clear it all out because the tomatoes are going in. While I'm harvesting, I'm not actually gonna pull it up. I find that Really, I just cut it off at the base and the plants don't regrow from the roots, but the roots are leaving all kinds of organic matter in the soil. Um, they'll just decompose over time. They'll be eaten by worms. They'll uh, leave air pockets in the soil that water can move through. So there's no point in pulling up those roots. The roots also pull up a lot of soil when you pull them up. So let's just leave them in the ground and let them decompose. I might dig up a little bit of them as I'm planting the tomatoes. As I'm digging those holes, that's fine, but I'm not gonna start the process by digging everything up. I'm just gonna smooth out the beds, uh, harvest everything by cutting it, and then uh, we'll dig holes for the tomatoes later. And it's pretty amazing to think that just as gardens are going into the ground and people are planting out, we are flipping this garden over into another one. I really love the winter greenhouse. Uh, it's one of the reasons that I wanted to build an unheated greenhouse early on, was going to the farmer's market in Halifax and seeing all these beautiful bags of spinach as early as February and March and talking to the farmers and they were like, yeah, what we do is we plant in the fall and then it sits there over the winter, uh, hangs out in the greenhouse and it doesn't die, but it doesn't really grow. And then when the days start to get longer, it starts to grow and there it is. And then we can go out and harvest it. So I was just really inspired by that because I find that trying to eat a local diet can be a real challenge because our season is so short and you end up relying a lot on vegetables that are preserved or stored, especially in the springtime. And the springtime also is when the weather starts to get nice and you really want to be eating all kinds of beautiful green food but it can really take a while before the gardens catch up with that desire so you know we're starting to get some asparagus and some rhubarb and some radishes and early greens from the farmers but most people haven't even sort of put in their gardens yet so having these protected spaces uh, in this unheated greenhouse is really fantastic and because it's unheated it doesn't cost me any money and extra fuel or electricity bills one of my favorite parts of this garden is figuring out how to best run this greenhouse every year and next year since we have so many more raised beds i also want to start building some uh, tops on them so they can act as gold cold frames and then i can uh, do even more overwintering because uh, there are so many plants that just will work really well in an overwinter environment as long as they have a little bit of protection. So I'm excited to keep experimenting with this. But this has been a great year for the spinach and I'm super happy and I'm like excited to get my last harvest out of here but also always kind of sad uh, because it's just, you know, the end of one crop and the end of... Uh, of plentiful spinach, but it's the beginning of something else, which is tomatoes. So that's also really exciting. You're listening to the Culinary Garden Show. We're played on CHMA 106.9 FM on Saturday mornings at 9 a.m. on CKDU 88.1 FM in Halifax, Nova Scotia on Thursdays at 4.30 p.m. And then we're also on YouTube as the Culinary Garden and on Apple Podcasts and Spotify as the Culinary Garden Show. So I've grown a lot of transplants and I'm ready to plant them outside. The temperatures are pretty consistently above 10 degrees at night and it's the end of May. So I'm feeling like this is a good time, but it's really important to make sure that the plants have been hardened off well. So the environment inside is so different than the environment outside that you really want to make sure that the plants are gradually adjusted and don't get shocked by being outside. So the first thing you're adjusting them to is temperature and earlier in the spring that's going to be lower temperatures so cold temperatures you when you bring them outside it's going to be a, a little bit more variable than it is in the indoor grow room so there's going to be bigger fluctuations between when the sun's shining and when it's not and the you know early morning as opposed to later in the afternoon so keep a close eye on the temperatures to make sure that they're going to stay warm enough the other factor is the sunlight so so they've been growing under fluorescent lights or LED lights, or maybe in sunny windows, but that still is nothing compared to the intensity of the sun's rays. And a lot of plants can get sunburned when they come outside. So you wanna make sure that they 
get a little bit of sun at a time, but not too much. And the first days that you harden off plants outside, it's great if it's like an overcast day like this is. So then they're getting um, the outdoor environment, but they're not having that intense sun shining on them. The other factor is wind and wind is a biggie, especially where we live. I keep a fan going in the grow room at all times, but still it's nowhere near the intensity of the wind when it's gusting and blowing strongly. I did have one of the tomato plants here break the other day because the wind was so strong. That's okay. I always plant too many tomato plants expecting that things like that might happen. So acclimatizing it to the wind is going to strengthen the stems, uh, st strengthen the plants in general and get them more used to being outside. The wind can be a really drying force. So it's important to make sure that they stay well watered. Um, sometimes they'll dry out really uh, more intensely than they would inside, but also uh, water is a factor. I've been growing soil blocks and keeping them in these uh, 10, 20 trays with a solid bottom. But then the other day it poured rain and I wasn't around. And when I came back, uh, I realized that basically all of the trays were totally filled up with water. So the plants were completely saturated, which was not a good thing. So I did manage to pour the water out and they're still a little bit wet now, but not in like a detrimental way. So I was glad I caught that uh, and didn't leave them to get soaked too long. And this is a step that I've skipped over the years. When I first learned about hardening off from garden books, it said, first bring your plants out for just half an hour at a time and put them in a shaded spot, then bring them out for an hour the next day, then the next day, maybe two hours. And even though that's a really nice idea to gradually uh, introduce your plants to uh, the outdoor environment, that's totally unrealistic. My garden's not at my home, so if I bring them out, I have to bring them back inside uh, on a schedule that makes sense. Often I'm at work also, so I can't be running in and out of the dining room to bring my plants in and out. So I think that's an ideal in some ways, but I think it's more reasonable to do something like bring your plants out for half a day at a time, they're in an area where they're slightly protected from the sun's rays. So they get uh, a little bit of sun in the morning, but then less in the afternoon, less in the evening. On one side, they have the wall and on the other side, they have the banister. When I started hardening them off, I would just bring them out for a little while in the afternoon when this was shaded and not put them in the sun at all uh, and leave them out for maybe half a day and then bring them inside at night. So temperature, the intensity of the sun and the wind are the most important things that you're trying to buffer these plants against. And now they're going to be ready to go in the garden and they're going to be a lot healthier. They're going to start growing when they go into the garden as opposed to uh, taking a longer lag period where they adjust to the environment. That means better overall health, which is great. Temperatures get warmer and the days get longer. Everything is really starting to grow in the garden. And this includes the plants that I've planted, but also weeds. Weeds can be a really discouraging part of gardening, especially if you let them get out of control because they can grow so fast that they dominate uh, your garden in a really short amount of time. And they can be really hard to get rid of, really exhausting, really a lot of work. Um, and it can feel uh, almost impossible sometimes, but I'm here to tell you that it's not impossible uh, and that a sustained effort against it bit by bit is going to make a huge difference and you can control these weeds in your environment um, as long as you're ready for it and pay attention to them. In a lot of ways paying attention to the weeds as they grow is as important to paying attention to your crops as they grow because uh, you want to stay on top of the weed areas, you want to make sure that they don't set more seeds and that they don't spread. So there's two major categories of plants or weeds. Uh, annuals and perennials. There's also biennials, but we won't worry about those too much. So annual weeds are weeds that basically are germinating from seed in your soil and they are just small seedlings that are growing. So the soil that you're dealing with, uh, even if you get soil brought in, it's going to have weeds in it. Any of them come from just wild plants in the environment uh, and they set seed every year. These also might be garden plants that you have that set seed that you maybe don't want growing. So uh, in here, I can see I've got these nice head lettuces growing and then a row of more head lettuces and a row of kale, or sorry, two rows of this, this lettuce here. But then there's also all these other plants growing. So this is the part where I get to figure out 
what's a weed and what's not a weed. In this case, it's pretty obvious because I've planted things in rows and I know that anything coming up outside of those rows is going to be something that I didn't plant. Whether or not it's a weed, uh, it takes a little while to figure out your identification. Um, the first leaves that come up on an annual weed are going to be the cotyledons or the seed leaves. So they're going to look different than the leaves that come up later. And then the first set of true leaves are going to be key to identifying what you're looking for. And you can find resources online or at the library that are specifically about identifying weed seedlings because this is a key stage where a lot of people are trying to figure out what they are. But even if you don't know what they're called, just knowing that they're a problem in your garden is going to help you. Um, a good key is if you see something coming up in a lot of different areas, then you know it's probably a weed and you didn't plant it. If you see something that uh, is growing outside of the lines that you planted, it's probably a weed and you didn't plant it. So uh, I find this is a really good reason to sort of keep my beds simpler and to do less interplanting than some people like to do, unless I really know what I'm planting and what it's gonna look like when it comes up. So doing some really elaborate interplanting is maybe something that's better when you have a little bit more experience and can better identify wild plants as they come up. So what have we got in here? We've got some uh, lamb's quarters and that is a uh, green that uh, grows a lot in like disturbed areas. So you'll see it a lot in like construction sites, which means that it ends up in soil that gets brought in, even bagged soil often. Um, and it can make as many as 40,000 seeds. So the thing about annual weeds is they're very easy to pull up when they're in the seedling stage. They're tiny, the root system is not really developed. Also got some hemp nettle here. This is another one I recognize. So I can just pull these guys up really easily and chuck them out. You don't even really have to pull them out and handle them individually. Another thing you can do is just take a tool like a trowel or a hoe and just run it along and disturb them. These little seedlings are so delicate. You know how se delicate seedlings are from gardening that um, all you need to do is just knock them out of the way. And especially on a hot sunny day, if the root's exposed to the, the sun, it'll just dry out and it won't re-root very vigorously. So that's an easy way to get rid of these. Uh, there's also a few things growing in here, like there's some cilantro and there's some calendula, and I did not plant these here, but they're coming up just because they've self-seeded in my soil. Also some Johnny jump ups, but I am gonna weed these out. Uh, in some cases, I like to leave a really wild bed with lots of different things happening, but in this one, I want it to concentrate on the lettuce. I want this lettuce to grow fast and I want it to be big and beautiful. So I don't want other things to get in the way. And this is the easiest kind of weeding. It's not a big deal. I find uh, sometimes it can be intimidating if you have a bed and you prepare it and then all of a sudden there's all these tiny weeds coming up. But uh, if you take a hoe and just go through it all and get rid of them, um, that usually will do the trick. Some people will even leave a bed for a week or so after they prepare it and then they can just get rid of everything and then they don't have to play the is it a weed or is it a crop game over and over again. And I mean, what is a weed? A weed is just something that's growing where you don't want it to. Uh, in a lot of cases, these are interesting plants. Uh, if they're growing in a different environment, you just don't want them in your garden because your garden is about growing things that you want to grow, which in this case is lettuce. So perennial weeds, I'm going to divide into two categories. I'm going to call these ones non-invasive perennial weeds. And which, which weeds are Invasive in your garden is depending on the environment, depending on your location, your climate, uh, what the land was used for, what the garden has been doing. Um, different weeds will appear as invasive in different areas. And I also find that that will change over time. So we've been gardening in this garden for 12 years and the weeds that we battle every year uh, have shifted a little bit as new things get introduced. Maybe we knock something back and then something else fills in. So. It's just sort of a constant, um, but one that's pretty ubiquitous everywhere are dandelions. And dandelions are a perennial weed, so they actually grow up from, from their roots every year. So any root that's left in the soil will produce a new dandelion. So it's good to use a trowel, something long, and then dig it all the way out. But they also produce a ton of seeds, and it's good to just pull the dandelion flowers off before they seed or mow them before they seed. Um, I know no more may is the thing, um, but really keeping dandelions under control is also good. Pulling dandelions out of your soil is not 
too difficult to do. If there's a lot of them, then I would say just pick your battles and decide which areas you want to be dandelion free and then leave other ones, obviously. Um, I'm not in favor of like pulling all the dandelions out of the lawn, but this is sort of becoming a bit of a, a patch that I know is going to grow up. And then there's some other plants in here, like this one uh, has a lot of different names. Uh, I call it ground ivy. It's also called creeping charlie, but there's about five different weeds named Creeping Charlie. It has a nice little purple flower and it is edible. It has kind of a, a interesting smell, kind of, I don't know how to describe it or compare it, but I don't find it especially delicious. It's a little bit on the bitter side. I'll use it sort of as a garnish sometimes, but it's not like an especially delicious part of a meal. And I find even though ground ivy can get all over the place, it's generally pretty easy to pull up because it doesn't root very deep. So if you just go at a patch with a trowel, and loosen the soil, lift it up a little bit. You can usually pull it out pretty easily and just keep an eye on that area and you can usually keep it from coming back too badly. Um, sometimes I'll let it go in a corner area. I think that's the other important thing sometimes is like not letting yourself think that your garden should be totally free from weeds, uh, but instead just picking the areas that can be weedy and picking the areas that you want to stay weed free. I'll pull out this little patch of ground ivy just because I don't want it to get out of control. It's also a patch that I can see from the window and I want it to look nice for the customers looking at the garden uh, and not have it look like a weedy mess. So these non-invasive perennials are ones that I would keep an eye on. I weed them out as I have a chance. I take them out of areas where I don't really want them to uh, get into a bed or where I don't want to look at them or have them be visible. Um, they look a little bit messy around the edges sometimes, but uh, I don't worry too much. It's sort of like, as I can deal with them, I do. Uh, and they can also be whippersnipped down. That's a good approach to dealing with them sometimes as well. They will come back, but at least it's a way to like knock them back and not have to look at them for a little while. So non-invasive perennials, not too worried about, but uh, good to spend a little bit of time on, on clearing them. So then there's the invasive perennials, and these guys are a real pain in the butt. Uh, gout weed, uh, creeping bellflower, knotweed, bindweed. There's a lot of different ones that can really create a headache and take over your garden in a really uh, fast and frustrating way. So what makes these plants especially hard to deal with is that they have a really difficult root system. So the root system can travel a long way underground. It can send up new plants at any point in the roots and any piece of root that's left in the soil when you're digging can create a new plant. So that makes it really hard to get rid of them because it's not just a matter of digging them up. They'll continue to come up again and again and again if all you do is dig. So right here we're dealing with bindweed. So bindweed uh, is coming up through this garden. It's coming from the other side of the fence so there's not much we can do about the source but what we've been trying to figure out is just how to isolate it so over this whole area we put down landscape fabric and then we put mulch on top and that's going to keep it from coming up in this area i have read reports of uh bindweed coming up through landscape fabric so i'm a little bit worried but we'll We'll see. We've had success using landscape fabric for this purpose in the past. Uh, I find it's better than cardboard because it uh, can be laid out in a continuous sheet and we overlap those sheets quite a bit so they can't crawl through the, the little gaps but they will find a gap and they will come out. So once the area has been cleared in some ways then it's about monitoring for it to come up. So the only strategy you really have is to over time starve the roots of nutrients. So all plants need to photosynthesize to live. And so if you can keep the green top parts from growing, the roots will eventually die, but that can take years. So this is a, a long-term project to eradicate the bindweed, um, but also just keeping on top of pulling up any shoots that do come up is just going to keep it from getting into your garden and taking over and especially from creating any more seeds because if it goes to flower and seed it's quite pretty it's a wild morning glory uh, it can create even more plants i find in an area that's closer to the source of the problem or closer to the sort of site where the plant's coming from it can be really discouraging because there's just so many roots there and they're all wrapped together and the soil can just become totally full of these roots 
um, that's true of a lot of these weeds. So what I try and do is focus on the areas that it's reaching into, smother the areas where the roots are too thick for you to dig them up, and then just move along and then find basically like the outer limit. So I've gone through this raspberry bed and I've gone as far as I can finding where the bindweed goes and then I'm tracking those roots back and trying to eliminate eliminate them that way. So trying to keep their spread down, um, trying to keep them from, from getting into different parts of the bed. And that's where I'm focusing my efforts because I only have so much so much energy to put into this. And I could basically spend all summer digging up bindweed if I wanted, but that's not really what I want to do and not the best use of gardening energy. So we need to be selective about uh, how much time we spend on it and then what we spend that time doing. So that involves being a little bit more strategic about weeding. I see some coming up that's between the landscape fabric and the garden bed here, which is full of raspberries. So what I'm going to do is just dig as much as I can and the roots even though they're quite thick, they will break. So you just have to dig as much of them as you can and pull them up. And then I usually will have a special bucket for invasive perennial weeds and I'll put them aside because I do not want those going in any kind of compost heap or brush pile. I wanna put those straight into either the municipal compost or into our garbage bin. So I know where the bindweed is coming from in this case, so I'm just going to follow the root a little bit back and then I'm going to cover it up again and it's going to continue to do that all summer. So all summer I'm just going to have to be returning to these areas once a week and pulling it up, but it's better than letting it just get out of control and this eventually will hopefully knock it back enough that uh, there won't be any more bindweed here. So fingers crossed and good luck to you if you're dealing with any of these perennial invasives. There's a lot of resources on the internet because it's a huge problem and a lot of people deal with these plants. They're very common. They're generally invasive and not native species um, and they've really found a niche to take off in, in our gardens and yards. So uh, good luck. So that's it for this week. I'd love to hear from you. If you're listening on the radio or watching it on the internet, uh, any ideas that you have, feedback that you have, or garden questions that you have, ideas for future shows would be super welcome. So you can email me. The email address is culinarykitchengarden at gmail.com. But also if you see me around Sackville, New Brunswick, where I live, feel free to ask garden questions and give me some feedback as well. So thanks and stay tuned until next week.